I brought this uh, print of Hineke Tepesong. I'll just send it around because um, it is true that street photography is a, is a term that seems to have come up in the, maybe the last 10, 15 years or something like this. And sometimes street photography is presented that you have to deal with human condition or homeless or something special or there have to be people in it. And I don't think so. And if you look at this screen over there, that is basically my definition of uh, street photography. And it is, I was walking down the street when, and then something happens. You walk into an alley, you walk into a store, you see a fire hydrant or something like this. And that is my definition of a street photography for me. I'll send this one around. This is not the really expensive <laughs> print. I wanted, I have certain prints I want at home, even I'm never there. This one I had framed is hanging in my hotel in LA. <laughs> and I tried it with it in the suitcase and it lasted. So this one is one from uh, 83 and it's made for the American uh, uh, Express exhibition. So it doesn't have his signature anywhere, but it has the stamp and stuff on the back. And I think this was uh, $1,800. And I was the first one who responded on it. I got an email from the Daily Photograph. And then when I picked it up, he says there was 11 other people who wanted to buy it. So I believe it's going to go up in value. So it wasn't like, <laughs> even if it's a cheap one, it's, it's going to be OK. So I'll just send it around. You can look at it. Don't be afraid of it. And you can look at the quality. And we just talked about if it came out a camera or a printer today, you would be like, what? Or if you put it on a forum, they would say like it's not even sharp or anything. And the funny thing is, my hotel in LA, I have some, uh, well, I have people from the US, France, and Mexico, and everywhere. And basically, nobody knew him. So they asked all kinds of funny questions about the photos. Did you take it? Uh, what's happening? Is it a war? Or what is it? And the story about this famous photo of Henry Kachepesong is that I saw it when I was a teenager. I was like 15, 16, 14. And it made a big impact on me. And I didn't know anything about him. So, so that's kind of interesting that. Despite everything, you can say technical and everything, uh, it's a picture with, uh, with great impact. <clears throat> so here, that's a photo I took recently in uh, Cuba. And you can see there's no people in it. I was just walking out 10 o'clock at night, and I see this car. I did wait for some people, but nobody came. <laughs> so I walked away. <laughs> the irony of it is that it was just a nightclub just to the left of it, on the other side of the street. The moment I walk away, I look back and I see a guy with two girls walking into the car. So had I waited two minutes more, I would have had a different photo. <clears throat> Here again, this is uh, also a street photography in my book. Even uh, it's a different street. And this is actually taken out of the window in, uh, I think it's Bangladesh and Nepal, with a 21 millimeter as we just drive by. There wasn't a lot of the photos that worked. <laughs> But we had a 10 hour drive, so we didn't have time to stop for, for that many times. And some of them worked. <coughs> this is also a street photography, in my opinion. And this is taken at the uh, Satoma Mong Hotel in uh, LA. And I went in for lunch there with uh, some film guys. And you specifically can't take any photographs in there. So I had those two uh, ladies sitting next to me. So I thought, can I, I asked them, can I take a picture? And I could. So that's pretty post, this one. This is also a street photography. <laughs> it is <laughs> uh, the streets of Qatar, which means it's out in the desert in Qatar. And uh, <clears throat> we were actually lining up to photograph horses and camels and stuff, a two-day project. And then came by a family with those two kids in the car. And if you look at the desert in, in Qatar, there's like, uh, you can see there's been cars driving all over the place. So it is kind of like, it counts as street, per the definition of a street. There, there was a survey done uh, a few years ago with Magnum photographers, the advice to young photographers. And the number one advice is get good walking shoes. <laughs> and it's true. And I, that gives me a chance to show my shoes. <laughs> it's not great walking shoes, but they will do. And here, there's a little bit low risk. So my philosophy on photography is basically I always have a camera with me. So even I walk to the other side of the street to get coffee, or I go in a car, or whatever I do, I always bring a camera, unless I specifically say, OK, I'm not going to bring a camera. And that's usually a bad idea. 
But sometimes I'll do it and just say, okay, I can actually walk without a camera. And if you look through uh, photography history, um, you will see that most photographs that are classics are photographs that just happened. Somebody had a camera and something happened and they were smart enough to take a picture of it. And here's a couple of examples. This is Elliot Erwitt, one of his uh, famous photographs. Of The uh, first time I saw it, I thought it was photoshopped because it looks like uh, it's a human body with a dog face photo photoshopped onto it. But the story behind this photo is that he walks down the street and he doesn't have a camera with him. And he sees this and he thinks, wow, that's, he must have thought, wow, that's a photo. So his friends walking with him, with him, with him have a Leica M6. So he borrowed that and a roll of film. And he takes 24 <coughs> photos of this dog and the woman. And if you look in the, in the book, Magnum uh, Photographs, uh, they have one with all the prints and the story behind them. Then you will see that this is photo number two or 23 of 24 photos. So that also gives you an idea that even without a camera you can actually do it. But also it's not that you just take one shot and then that's the master shot. And a lot of people have this idea that you have Henrik Kessel Besong or somebody, you just take a roll with 60 to 36 pictures and you go out and you make 36 master shots. And that's not the case. If you look, Henrik Kessel Besong has a 30 years career and he probably has something like 250 photos that circulate on postcards and posters and everything. And maybe has like five or ten iconic photographs that is really Henrik Etebe song. So that's 30 years of work and God knows how many rolls of film. So of course he has photos also that is blurry, out of focus, wrong exposure, the film didn't rewind or something like that. Uh, so that happens. And here's another one of uh, Elliot Erwitt, and that's actually my favorite photo of him. It's called California Kiss. Uh, it's a little bit expensive, so I haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> but that would be the first one I would buy of, of him. And the story behind this photo is that he joined Magnum Photographs two years after he left, the, or not two years after, but three months after he left the military. And uh, <clears throat> two years later, he went on a holiday, and of course he brought his camera and he took this photograph. Then he goes home to Magnum, he turns in the rolls of film, they develop, and it goes into the archive, nobody pays attention. In 1980, he was doing an exhibition, so in 79, he was going through his archive to see what should be an exhibition, and he finds this photograph. So it could be staged, it could be whatever the story is with the photo, but it's just interesting to see that the most, the best Elliot Erwitt photo, in my opinion, is one, it's just a holiday photo, and nobody really paid attention to it for almost 40 years. And that's another Elliot Erwitt, and that's also street photography. And he did a lot of dogs. And here we have Henrik Kete So it's taken behind uh, a train station in Paris. I looked it up last time. I wanted to go and see if I could do something similar, but it just, <laughs> they rebuilt the whole place now, so it doesn't look like this. Uh, but it is just an empty ground, a building site, wherever there's nothing dramatic about it. And Henrik Kete is one of those who says that he never crops his photographs. So you will see some old school photographers that have like this little black, black edge around in the picture, and that is like the frame of the negative. This one is actually cropped because it has much more darker to the left uh, because he's shooting it through a hole. Uh, and that's kind of ironic that his most famous photograph is actually cropped. <laughs> um, and it's not particularly sharp or anything, but it's a great photograph. Also, painters did street photography. And if you know the definition of uh, photography, you know it means uh, writing with light. You could also say painting with light. Before photography, they had to use uh, canvas and uh, paint. Here's another famous street paint. <laughs> That's a new term we're making today, street paint. Hashtag that. <laughs> I haven't bought that one either. So <clears throat> what can you photograph in the street? And for me, any photography is a storytelling. And you can say, when I carry my camera all the time, it means, well, I flew here yesterday from LA, and then I, we went out to have some food last night. I deliberately didn't bring my camera because it was in the bags. I thought, okay, we're just going to go down five blocks and eat. There comes this steam up from the street, which is kind of like it always does in New York photos. But here, there was like, it, it, was, like, it was like nine o'clock in the evening, <clears throat> so it's dark, but there's light from behind from Madison Square Park. 
And when people walk through this, they have really dark silhouettes, and the ones behind have like gray silhouettes. So it's like that would have been a great photo. So it's just one of the cases where I say, yeah, but I decided not to bring my camera, and I'm going to go back tonight <laughs> with a camera and see just because. So one thing, of course, is people. Uh, for me, I actually don't think about what do I photograph. Uh, what makes me think and analyze what do I do and why do I do it is when people start asking questions or they point out that I do something and then I look, oh, that's right, you know. Uh, but it's not that I have a style or a rule that there have to be p people or it have to be this or that. But when I analyze my pictures, what I look for is people and light. And for me, that is basically the two um, types of life force that we have, life energy. Uh, one thing, obviously, people is life. Uh, for me, also light is life. If you read my book, The Magic of Light, Finding the Magic of Light, you will see that I talk about what is light. And even, uh, I mean, the scientist doesn't really know what is light, you know. And for me, I'm still, every time I hear about light, I think, wow, that's, what is it, you know? Because it brings life to plants, you know. You go out and there's sunshine, you're happy. And if there's no sunshine, you're less happy. So why, 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 why is that so important, you know? What is life? So people, obviously, is interesting. This is from the other day in LA. Uh, he doesn't look like he's from LA, but he is. I mean, he is from Argentina, but he lived there for 30 years. We talked to him after I photographed him. And here comes the light. And this is from Cuba. And for me, it, it is really like I walk for this light. Uh, I don't walk for the people or the street. It's, it's like I would deliberately walk down that street because I like the light, and then I'll see what happens. And it's not that I have any idea before I walk down if something is going to happen or not. Another thing in composition is timing. And here is very precise timing because I have the frame here. I set the focus here, and I'm waiting for the bicycle. I think I saw her, and then I get ready. And I have this Volkswagen in the, in the background. It's in uh, Munich. Uh, and I was just lucky to get her. So I think I just hold it down, took three photos, and one of them worked. And you also have rhythm in photography. So rhythm is simply just you can have a slow rhythm of something. So rhythm is repetition with high speed or low speed. And here's some sort of rhythm to also the people. It's not that you have to be able, in my opinion, you don't have to be able to argument for why you like a photograph. I wouldn't be able to, for example, tell what is it exactly that I like about this Henrik Zeppe song. I just know I like it. Uh, and for me, that's enough. The main thing in photographs, in my opinion, is emotions, because that's the first thing you see in a photograph. You don't look for sharpness or colors. You may see the colors and a cute dog or something like that, but the first thing is the emotion of the photograph. And you say some people are attracted to photographs with, uh, well, I, I try to, I think most of my pictures have hope and, and life and happiness. I don't really do war or homeless people or something like that. Um, but I think that's also, it's different from person to person differently, but it's also different in time. And I remember when I was uh, younger, in the 80s, all the movies, a good movie per definition was one you went, when you walked out the cinema, you were sad and depressed and everything was dark. And that, I know that changed, that's not the type of movies I go see anymore. We do have some French cinemas or <laughs> very cultural cinemas in Denmark, I can still go see them, but it's not the type of movies that it's kind of like winning the Oscars these days. Then we have gestures. And I use this expression because uh, somebody else used it. And gestures is kind of, you could say, what maybe a lot of people think that's what you photograph, that you have to walk down the street here in New York, and then something has to happen. And for me, nothing really has to happen because it's light and people. And for me, just the, the light from behind and the ribbon of people walking that can make a photograph. So I don't have to have some controversy or some special thing happen. And see, this is an example of gesture. So it's just an expression that I happen to sit next to them in Berlin in a cafe. And I'm not <coughs> capturing this expression, but that's the expression that he has for that second I took the picture. The next one, he probably looks really friendly uh, and nice. And also here you see that's a gesture. It's a skateboarder in Oslo is jumping. Uh, 
just a moment that I am taking the picture. And it's not that I just came and I took that photo. I came and I saw they were skating and they had kind of like two lines they were skating on. And I decided, okay, I'm going to have the light from behind and then I'm just going to hold the camera here and then I can hear when they come. And some of them would jump, so when they come here, I'm just going to take free photos. So I probably spent like 10, 20 minutes in that location and right that one, maybe five, 10 minutes, I was just waiting for somebody. So I have a lot of photographs where there's nobody in the photo or something disturbing in the background or wrong focus or anything. But here you have 0.95 in Luxlux. It's actually pretty sharp and I even have a, a tramp in the background. So that's extra <coughs> lock and no uh, modern cars. So that's a, that's a good one. And that we get into, you also have focus. So one thing you can say, you can have a picture in focus. There's a lot of talk about sharpness on online forums, but in focus actually means that something is sharp or that it's very clear. So it doesn't mean that you have to be able to zoom in and see if something is really in focus. So <clears throat> one way I also play with focus is that I use narrow focus. So I deliberately put your attention where I want to put it. And it also solves another problem for me. So I use the, the 0.95 not looks a lot. Because with that one, you don't really have to be concerned about the background because it's gone. And I like to shoot against the light. <coughs> so it also means I have this exploding background. It doesn't matter that it's overexposed or anything because it's out of focus. Um, <coughs> and a picture like this, I walk down the street and I have an idea, OK, I want to do something here. So I'm just going to have this composition. And I basically focus on the Vespa. And I'm just waiting to see who comes by. And then here's one of the guys coming by. And I'll just hold down uh, the shutter release and take three photos. And then hope one of them is in focus. And he looks cool. And here he has like this spatial look. Sometimes they look angry at you, or they look away, or they like close their eyes or something. So you don't really know what happens. But you just know you have the scene there. It could be nice if something happened there. Um, so that's basically what, what I trust is going to that's another one for that first. This one before was Paris. This one is also Paris. And uh, this is a photograph that I didn't consider anything because uh, we were doing a workshop. So we were at the end of the day. And then we went in to have a coffee and end off. And then one of the guys asked, how do you photograph rain? Because it had been raining all day. So I said, well, you don't photograph the rain coming down. I mean, you could, but then you have to have slow, slow shutter speed so you get lines. Um, and then you should have light coming in from behind so you can actually see the lines. And that's how they did it in the old days. With the jazz photos, you see all the smoke. Uh, that's, they used a the flash or light behind to get the smoke out. Uh, so what I said is you go out and then you go down and you play with the reflection. So it's much better having people walking like this or with umbrellas than the actual rain. So you actually don't see the rain. And while, while we were walking, I thought, OK, Paris traffic in the rain, that's going to be cool. It's already crazy. Without the rain, so in the rain, it's going to be even worse. So I'm just kneeling down next to the parked cars, and I have the scooter, so I just focus on her face. And, and I'm hoping to get some action of like, because the, sc the scooters and motorbikes will go. I mean, they're crazy it's like bees, you know. So I hope to get some action like that. But I'm just preparing for it. So I take a couple of shots of her. And the, move, the traffic isn't moving, so I'm just like, OK, forget it. And then later I edit it, and I put it on Facebook or something. And some people say, wow. How do you do that? And it's amazing. And I love the light. And then I look, it's like, yeah, OK. That wasn't what I wanted to do. But I see if you weren't there, then it's, it looks like she's actually moving. But she's just waiting for green light or something. But again here, definitely you can see I use the focus. If you zoom in on this one, you see how it's actually pretty much in focus. Uh, the front of the scooter is not going to be in focus. And the background is totally blurred. Uh, and for me, <coughs> A picture is that I have a person or something, and then the background is just an atmosphere. So you could say atmosphere, what is that? It's basically an emotion. It doesn't matter. You don't need to know. You don't even need to know it's Paris. Uh, that type of light and out of focus is going to do something to you. And you don't need an explanation for why it does or how it does it. Always wear a camera. That's my <coughs> slogan. But I actually made a cleaning cloth for my uh, my lenses that says, always wear a camera. <laughs> so that's my, my slogan. <clears throat> and what does that mean? Well, it means uh, normally I always have a camera with me. I always have it across here. 
and it rests here so it doesn't go into the kidney or something and it doesn't bang around here, but I just have it here so I can put it here, I know it's here, and it doesn't weigh a lot. Um, and that's basically the simplicity of it. And it's uh, on and it's set on the right ISO for where I am, um, so I'm ready to take a, a photograph within a few seconds. And I'll walk out the door, and it's not that I have an idea that today I'm going to take a photograph. I often have the idea that I don't feel like something or probably nothing is going to happen because, you know, but I just have the rule of bring a camera anyways. And what happened is, like for example yesterday, we walked down four or five blocks, and I have enough evening photos of New York so I don't have to worry about making some. And then I see this smoke or steam coming up, and I'm like, what? I didn't bring a camera. So that's what happens. That suddenly you get inspired, you see something that's interesting. And you could say, even you walk into B&H here and you think, oh, there's not going to be any photo opportunities in here. And usually they don't like that you take photos of the staff here. But you never know that maybe you see something that's interesting. So that's why you have a camera with you. So that's the simplicity of uh, my philosophy. And here's a, <coughs> a quote from a Kierkegaard, so he's a Danish uh, writer, he says, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forward. And the interesting thing about Kierkegaard is that he lived in Copenhagen. He's kind of a depressing uh, writer, but very good and famous and everything. So he lived in Copenhagen, and he did, every day he would take a walk in Copenhagen, and he called it, it was like a, a human bat. So we'd go out and take a bat and all the people on the street, and some of them he knew and said hello to, and he was also a little bit celebrity. Some people knew him and said hello. But that was basically his research. That's how he got inspired to write. <coughs> and he said it's the same that happens when you take a camera with you and you go out and look at stuff outside. You don't know if you're going to see anything or if anything happens you want to photograph. But that is basically your research. You look, you look around, you observe, and say, wow, that's cool. I never noticed this. Uh, <coughs> and a photo, I didn't bring it here. This is really low risk. Uh, I didn't bring it here, but for example, I was walking in uh, LA, uh, four o'clock in the afternoon or something, down the street, and there's a street lamp that the shadow of the street lamp, the shape of it on the wall is like the Statue of Liberty. And it was so obvious, so I just take a picture of it. And it's not super pretty or something, but it's just like, I come back in 10 minutes, it's gone. I come back tomorrow, maybe it's there or not. Uh, and I was doing a workshop, so I said, hey, look at this. I said, wow, the Statue of Liberty. I mean, it was so <laughs> obvious everybody could see it, but just like, who would have known that you would see the Statue of Liberty in uh, LA? So he did research, and he didn't bring a camera, but he had his pen and paper, notebook and paper. That was his way of always being ready, always wear a pen. This is uh, another quote. Read and write four to six hours a day. If you cannot find the time for that, you can't expect to become a good writer. And that is, I forgot his name for a moment, the big uh, American writer that does uh, horror. And so, yep, exactly. I should have put it here so I could, I'm really bad with names. So you could say that, that's his way of research. He doesn't say right all day. He has a quota of 2,000 words a day. That's what he tries to accomplish. Um, but if he can't write, he'll read, because somehow that's his research or inspires him or something. Or maybe he reads the newspaper or something else. It doesn't matter. Um, <coughs> I have a quarter of 117 pictures a day. Uh, it's not that I have it, but that's when I looked back, when I got the M, like M9 in 2009, I noticed that in the first year, I took 117 pictures a day in average. And funny enough, that have continued ever since. It's just about there. So I have days where I actually don't take any photographs or take very few. And I'll have other days where I'll just walk out, and then I'll take four or 600 or something. Or I did an event in LA here where I took uh, 2,000 photos, so then I'm good for a few days. <laughs> I can sit down and relax. Um, <coughs> and it's not that I make 117 master shots a day. Uh, I don't even know what my percentage is. Maybe I edit. When I edit 117 pictures, then 20% of them is something that I edit and keep in my archive as photos that I might use for something. And sometimes I get an iconic, uh, and maybe one or two are good out of uh, 117. 
And sometimes you don't know if it's a good photo, so that's why I will share on Facebook and Instagram and see what is the response to it. Um, <coughs> here's an example of, you could call it street photography. This is from uh, Cambridge University. So I had uh, some friends who could get me into the Cambridge University so we could get a tour. And some of the places you can't take photographs. So of course we would take photographs there, sneak around. Uh, and it's, it's like traveling back 100 or 200 years. And we get out in one of the courtyards and there's like this uh, field of grass and there's two, those two old guys in the middle of it. And I just changed, I had a 21 on because I was just in sneaking photos from the canteen that looks like some Harry Potter where you can take photos. So I changed to my Noclux and I go out and just walk around those guys in a circle and take photos of them. And they're just talking out there and you can tell that they have noticed me, like there's some disturbance in the force or something but they just keep talking. And then they split, they walk each their way, and then one of them says, uh, you can't be on the grass. So I go out of the grass again, I find out it's only if you're that old and you have been at that university for, I don't know, 40 years and you have some title, you can walk on the grass. Everybody else has to walk outside. So that's also the point that they walk deliberately. Let's meet on, on the field. <laughs> so they go from the office and they meet in the middle of this so everybody can see they're allowed to be there. Whatever, you know, but it's just <laughs> very interesting. <clears throat> then there is one question that comes up, rules of photography. And I actually put, there's 10 rules that uh, are the rules here in the US and it's basically the rules in most countries. And I'll just go through them. The rule number one, or law, is that you can make photographs of anything and anyone on any public property. So it's not that you cannot take photos of anything. Anything in public you can take pictures of. Two, you may shoot on private property if it's open to the public. So that means a train station, the Apple store, a mall or something. The thing is, you can have somebody coming and often they will do, they will come and tell you you cannot take photos here. And sometimes they will even have a sign by the door that you cannot take photographs here. And then you just say okay and you stop. And you say it's up to your own personal ethics and everything, how you want to do it. I know from experience that if I were walking to a museum, for example, in my local city, I would go a lot to the museum with my kids because it was a great place. They had cafe and art and it was safe. They couldn't fall off the building and stuff like this. Uh, so I know I walk into one room and there's my daughter sitting and looking at some expensive Hammerhoy photo and then I can take a photo. And then most likely when I take three photos, a guy kind of comes and says, no photos in here. I say, oh, sorry. Then I go to the next hall and there's a new guard. So now we start over again. So I'm not going to be around with my camera like this, but I'm going to like, oh, I'm going to do this one. And I'm just going to freeze out. Oh, sorry. And then I walk to the next one. So <clears throat> you kind of know that you start photographing in a place. Somebody's going to come and tell you you can't. Uh, and they're basically right. Uh, so it means that you have to save your shots and also there's a very cool cafe in LA where generally they, they don't care if you take photographs but sometimes you walk in with five or ten people with cameras and then the man manager will come out from the back and says no photographs here and then that kind of ruins it but then you can sneak photographs anyways. One of the students did, did a real cool photo in there. Uh, private property owners can prevent photography on their property but not photography <laughs> of their property from a public location. Uh, and that's good to know. I tried in uh, London. Um, we were doing a workshop. I walked down the street and I see there's like guards in front of the street. And I'm like, that's, I wonder what that is because it didn't look like an embassy or nothing happened. It was just like security. So I stand in front of my camera and I'm just looking and trying to figure out what it is. Then comes a guy in civilian and says, no pictures. I said, yeah, I can take pictures if I want to. Why don't you know the rules? And I go to the guy and said, this guy said you can't take photographs. He doesn't know the rules. So it turns out that it's just like a private school that have extra protection. And of course, you can take photos from outside of it. So you could say you should just know what are the rules for this. <clears throat> Anyone can be photographed without consent when they're in a public place unless there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. 
So you say you don't take it into a sauna in Germany <laughs> because they're all naked uh, and probably not here also. And you go with the culture, you can say I will go down to uh, uh, Madison Square Park, or I'll go down to, uh, there's a park by 11th Street. So I'll go in and there's people on the grass sometimes, whoops, and there's also a dog park, so I'll go into the dog park. I would never go in to where the kids are playing and take photos in there because it's just going to be trouble <laughs> and, and I, don't, I don't need that type of photos in there anyways. I can photograph them on the street. Um, so you could say like you treat others like you want it to be treated, like if you want to, you know, sit somewhere uh, in private, then it's probably the same for other people. Despite common misconceptions, the following subjects are almost always permissible. Fire scenes, criminal activities. It's just if it's sealed off, you have to have a press card to get in. Not that many of us would want to go in and photograph a fire, but you can photograph anything from outside. You can photograph children, celebrities, law enforcement officers. And I know here in the US, people don't like to photograph the police. And sometimes the police doesn't like it either. But the law is actually that you can photograph the police. British infrastructure and stuff like this, uh, you can photograph that. And you will meet a lot of security that sit and watch you from inside the desk and they see you on the camera taking pictures of the building and they come in and ask why you take pictures of the building and if you could please stop. And that is basically they're misinformed and they're probably bored because nothing else happens. So, so it's not that you're a terrorist just because you have a camera. Um, <coughs> Security is rarely an acceptable reason for restricting photography. Photographing from a public place cannot infringe on trade secrets, nor is it a terrorist activity. Let me get more into the terrorists. Private parties cannot detain you against your will unless serious crime was committed in the presence. Those that do so may be subject to criminal and civil charges. So you cannot have a security guard in a mall asking you to delete photos or give you your card or they're going to take your equipment or they're going to hold you back. Um, not at all. And not even the police can do it. <coughs> it's a crime for someone to threaten injury, detention, confiscation or arrest because you are making photographs. And it, one of the reasons it says here is because it's happened. <laughs> People would take pictures in London of architecture and then all kinds of stuff happens. Nine, you are not obligated to provide your identity or reason for photographing unless questioned by a law enforcement officer and state law requires it. And even they can't confiscate. Private parties have no right to confiscate your equipment without a court order. Even law enforcement officers must obtain a court order unless making an arrest. No one can force you to delete photos you have made. And these things I actually have for UK and for the US, I have on my iPad and iPhone, so just in case I get in doubt, I can see what is actually the law. Uh, so that's the actual law of it. There's a few places like in uh, Switzerland and Germany, apparently you cannot take pictures of people in public and use them. Um, if you go there, you will see that's not really how it's being done or not done. And you say, if I take pictures of somebody in Berlin and I make an exhibition in Hong Kong or New York, I mean, what are they going to do, you know? So I just think it's my responsibility that the pictures I take of people, that they actually look good in them. And I am aware if somebody is sitting in a restaurant or cafe with somebody, that maybe it's not the person they're supposed to sit with, so maybe I shouldn't publicize it or something, you know, uh, or only show the hands or something like this. So, of course, I mean, you just. Treat others like you want it to be treated yourself. Uh, and that's part of your photography style also. <coughs> then we have a really good question, is the model release. And you don't need a model release if you photograph people in the street or anywhere to get a model release, unless you want to use them in a commercial. So you can take photos of anybody in the public, and you can put it on a newspaper page, blog, website. Uh, basically anything. You can even sell them in galleries and you can put them in photo books that you sell and make little or a lot of money on. It's not considered commercial. What is considered commercial if you make a, an ad and saying that I moved to New York and started drinking Coca-Cola and then that's a commercial. That's an ad. 
and then you have to have a model release. And if you say when you need a model release, it basically means you have to have the person's consent. And if it is a commercial, you'll probably also pay them some money for it because uh, now they're like a professional model. Anybody else you don't need uh, to have them sign anything if you don't plan to use it commercially. The only reason if you upload pictures to uh, to websites where you can sell microstock pictures or get images, they want to have model release on everybody in the photos, but that's because they want to be able to use it uh, to license it out for commercial. Uh, anything else you don't need it for. And here is, speaking of model release, this is a woman I met in, uh, in Havana. She was standing outside looking at the street. And we asked him to take some pictures, and we could. And she looks amazing. She is uh, 94, 96 years old. Um, here's another guy I met in a park in uh, London, and I said, Can I take a photo of you? And I could. And I actually have pictures of people. <coughs> uh, there was one guy in, uh, I remember, in San Francisco. That I'm just waiting for somebody to walk by, and then comes a guy with a t-shirt that says, uh, wine less, fix more. And he just, the whole thing looked cool, so I posted. it. And some months later, he sent me an email if, he can, if I can send him the file so he can make a print of it. And then you find out who it is, but often you don't know. Style. Uh, you could say I have a style uh, that I'm not really aware of because I just take photos when I feel like it. And when I look at what did I actually take pictures of, there is some things that goes again. And you can say that is, that is my style. Um, and you say everybody have a style from the moment they pick up a camera. And the last one who is aware of it is going to be yourself, because you just pick up the camera and you take a photo. And you don't think it's anything special. But to other people, it's usually special because it looks uh, different than, than what they would do. And if you looked at my pictures, you will see like this depth of field, like out of focus background, the light, this thing with lines shooting down the street or something like this is very how I do it. But it's not the only thing I do, but you could say then even I shoot some, something without people, it's, it's going to have elements of that style. And <coughs> I talked with a photographer here the other day that he has a, a studio set up, so he has like this background and he has a big well, now he has a Leica also, but he has like a phase one camera, and he does 100 megapixel uh, pictures. And then everything is kind of set up that this is how he wants it. But then he will decide, I'm going to move the camera slightly, because then it's going to look a little bit different with the nose or something. So he has the whole setup. You can say, that's pretty locked up. But I basically have the same. So I'll walk out. Uh, well, one thing is, whenever it rains or snows or something special is occurring, especially in LA, I actually find it really boring in LA. I know if I walk out, I'll find something, but it's so hot, and, and you can't even walk. I mean, it's like you have to drive, and it's difficult compared to, for example, New York. But if it rains in New York or in LA, I'm going to be straight out. If it snowed, I would definitely be out, but it's <laughs> not likely. The same here in uh, New York. Uh, I love when I've experienced two, uh, two blizzards here, so I've been really lucky. I got all the blizzards in New York. Um, but I'll walk out in the early morning when the light is low, and I'll walk out in the late afternoon when the light is low. And for example, here in New York, you can walk uh, 6th Avenue here, you walk down toward the village. Around, uh, I guess, this time of year, 6.30, 7 o'clock, the sun goes down 7.30. Then you're going to have the light coming in from the Hudson River down the streets. And that's like, every time you get one block down, <laughs> it's a new photo opportunity, the next one. And that goes on for 20 minutes. Um, so you can say that's my style. We have Felix just arrived down there in the back, hiding in the back. So he has a style. Uh, he has almost as big as a setup as in Leibovitz. And Leibovitz, he he doesn't have free talks, but he does have. He will go out in the water with reflectors and lamps and everything. And you can say that's a setup. That's something you know. This works. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, I just have a camera with me, but it is the states I set up is this is the type of light, this is the scene I want. I will shoot down the street or something, or I'll wait for people. Um, and you can say this is very typical. It's so typical that sometimes when I do it, it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> but then 
I also like it. I mean, I just can't stop it, you know. But this is, uh, for me, it's almost too simple, you know. Uh, so the big thing is to wait for somebody who actually looks cool. This one is also, you could say it's locked, but it's also my style, and that is in Istanbul. And there's a story on my website that you may or may not have read. Um, and we're also doing a work so and I'm walking uphill and it's hot and we're kind of tired. And then I see this light on this bakery. And at the same time I see this light and that is my type of light. It's not that all the buildings look like, like that, but the light there is great. And in the mo same moment there comes this little boy bicycling, parks his bicycle outside the bakery. And I'm too slow so I didn't, don't get him before he walks in. But I think, well, he's going to come out again, so I'm just going to set up everything and wait for him. And the moment he comes out, I take probably like 15 photos. So one of them is when he gets on the bike and so on. And then I actually follow him with focus, which I usually don't do. So I get this one. So when I sit and edit, I said, wow, that's the one. That expression and the whole thing, that's the one. Uh, that It wasn't what I planned, but that's the one that I like the best of them. And you can say, it's like, I see this, that's my state. It's like, I have to take a photo of it. Uh, other people have other things they look for. You could say Elliot Erwitt definitely has spent a lot of his time looking for dogs because that's one of his subjects. You have this one is New York that is on, uh, that must be 6th Avenue, it's just outside Burger and the Fashion Institute over there. And it's one of those days where it's raining, so it's perfect. <laughs> it's just what I like, light from behind, rain, people, uh, that's what I do. Um, <coughs> this is also what I do. Uh, you see, there's no people, it's not anything special. When I got the knock loose the first time, one of the first pictures I took was something like this. And I liked it so much. And then later I got an email from a guy who said, when I saw that photo, I bought a knock looks. And the knock looks like ten, eleven thousand dollars Back then it was the one point zero thing, so it was only six, six seven thousand dollars So even I didn't consider anything, now I'm like, when I see this, like, yeah, no, I'm just gonna take a photo just because. It's nothing special, but they don't look like this in other places in the world, you know. So for anybody who is not used to see these ones, this is kind of unique, you know. And you also have, part of the style is that <coughs> sometimes you have, I will meet people say, I haven't found my style yet. And what do they mean? Well, some people mean, well, I don't know if I'm doing like, uh, beauty or I'm doing landscape or something, but you actually don't have to categorize your style. Uh, in my opinion, when you start photographing, then you're going to pick up your camera and take a photograph whenever you see something that's interesting. And that could be a portrait, it could be a car, it could be some colors, lines in the street. And then when you start looking back, that you see that there are certain things that that's simply what you do. And it doesn't have to involve people, cars, dogs or anything particular or it doesn't have to be happy or unhappy or anything. Uh, but it could be that you just do really happy photos, or you could say Elliot Erwitt did a lot of dogs, so you could say that's definitely his style, he had a lot of humor in it, so you said that's his style. Maybe technically there's no real signature, except it's, it's mostly black and white. Uh, Henrik Zepesson definitely had a style of uh, shapes and lines and timing, uh, and basically all black and white also. Uh, but it's not that you first find out what your style is and then you go do that. No, you just do whatever you feel like and then you're going to, if somebody asks you what is your style, then you can tell them. But that's how important, it's not really important. For me, my style is only important when somebody asks what kind of photographs you do. I say, people in atmosphere. And I don't know what that is, but it explains, it's enough. So they're like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, they just want to know if I do a wedding or something like that. Part of my style is also that I'm in invisible. And uh, invisible just means that my approach to photographing people in the street is that I don't go ask first. Uh, generally, they don't know that I took a photo. Uh, you could say that's the ideal because I want to photograph what I saw and not something that has changed. And as soon as they see or you ask, can you can I take the photo? It's going to change. Sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. So then I'll try to just sneak in, take the photo, and usually I get out of there without nobody noticing. It's not because I'm trying to hide. I'm not hiding at all. I'm just not there. 
so I never do something like, you know, you can sit in the subway in Tokyo and then you have you sit over for this person and you go like, and you just take photos and you hear the clamor clicking. It's like no, you just go like this and you move slow. They don't really notice you. Uh, if you go like this, they probably notice you and think you're creepy. But if you just do like this, and you just hold the camera here, nice focus, you just wait for him to just go, and then you look, they will take one, and you just hang here, and then you just, when something else happens, he falls back asleep, you take another one, and that was it. Uh, <clears throat> so you don't have to hide it. And it is a photography style. And I mean, I'll wear a hat, orange scarf, shoes, and just walk straight in, and they don't notice me. I have no idea what a sickness. I mean, you could say, okay, I'm not homeless. I don't look criminal. I don't know, but at least it rules out some of the possible dangers. So I don't know. Uh, but I move deliberately not to be noticed. Uh, but it's not that I'm hiding. Other times, uh, you just have somebody sitting, two people sitting on a bench over there in a the park. And I mean, you cannot walk over and shoot them with a 50 millimeter without them noticing it. So it's kind of creepy, you just go, you know. So you just go and ask, can I take a photo of you? And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And you go into a cafe and somebody noticed you took a picture. And they look like question marks. So I'll just go and say, I'm just took, I just took your picture. And that's it. Sometimes I ask, can I get your, uh, do you have a, uh, I'll give them and say, yeah, here's my uh, card, send me an email if you want a picture. 95% of people don't ask for it, even if they ask, can I get the picture? You give them your card, you don't hear from them, which is kind of weird. So if you want them to have the picture, you take your phone and ask them to put in the email, and you make a note what picture it was, because else you forgot in two days which person it was. Um, <clears throat> in New York, it's so great that you photograph somebody, and they're like, what? You're taking our photo? Yeah. Uh, can you just do what you're doing? And then they will actually go back to character. And you'll have other people, they see, like, they're reading, like, and then they go back to, they go into character, they're ready to be cast for anything, you know. <laughs> um, and it differs from uh, country to country. In, <laughs> in uh, LA, they're a little bit like, uh, you know. And it doesn't matter if they're homeless or celebrities, they all behave like, uh, you know. And <laughs> that's one of the few places in the world you actually see that you're out in a neighborhood and up on the other corner of the block, there's a guy with his dog. They always walk like this with the phone, and they stand like this. And then they see you, and then they're like, then they walk. They don't want to walk down the street to get the picture taken. They're going to walk somewhere else, you know. So that's unique for LA mostly. In uh, Paris, they can be quite annoyed with uh, street photography. And per the law, you're actually not allowed to take photos uh, of any people without their consent. And it's like the home of street photography. <laughs> so, but I mean, in reality, it doesn't apply. I never met anybody in Paris who said, hey, you cannot take my photo because of the law or something. So, but what they will do is they will say, they're like, oh, you know, or you have some pretty lady or have somebody, they can be like this. But the thing is that in Paris, if you notice, they will come here, I'll show you. So we'll come walking on the street like this, and you're standing there, oh, you know, and they walk on. So it's not personally, it's not because you're taking a photo, it's just because you are in Paris. <laughs> so you don't have really have to worry about it. Uh, and you can say you get your photo, so it doesn't matter. Uh, Istanbul, you would think that that's going to be really tricky. And some of them are, just comes from the mosque or something, or they're religiously dressed. Not a problem. So I tried, like, you walk into a square that's the, twice the size of this room, and there's old people and young people sitting around, locals in the sun, and there's a water fountain in the middle. So you walk in a work workshop, and you think, OK, so maybe we have to run in a second when the first one takes a picture. But that's not the case. They all love it. You can just, we could walk around there for half an hour, take photos of everybody, and they'll just uh, sit and talk and enjoy the sun, and sometimes they would pose, you know. The same, you meet somebody, you take photos of the kids in the street, and say, hey, and they move away so you can take photos of the kids, you know. So that's Istanbul. So there's basically nowhere in the world where you cannot get away with taking photographs. And you can say, if you're in communication with people and you respect people and you kind of sense what's going on here, uh, it is kind of easy. 
And you say the more you do it, the more you're out there and you have your camera with you, the more natural it's going to be. Uh, if you have a camera back and you go into a McDonald's with your kids and you see, wow, that's a cool photo, see with camera and then see what I take, and you have to turn it on and set the ISO and take all the settings first. It's too obvious, you know. It's too much work, so it's just you're not going to take the photo. So that's one reason why you just have a camera with you that you know well and you can, you can operate really quickly. This is the waiter. He's actually friends in my hotel. And uh, the young girl had the day off. <laughs> I don't think that's why he looked like this, but I sent it to her and said he's praying for her return. <laughs> too much work. Uh, this one, speaking of being invisible, this is in Cuba. So I have those uh, two, there's two girls over with their mother, and she was also over there. So I take some photos, and it's low sun, and the building behind is yellow and stuff, and it's like, this looks cool. So I'm trying to frame this thing and get something out of it, and then I'm like this, and then I, I notice there's like a person standing here. So this girl is just standing here in front of the camera, like <laughs> I'm, I'm being photographed, and then I <laughs> turn the camera and and shoot. I actually don't get the full body, but I still, every time I see this picture, I, I kind of like it, maybe because of the story, but also the expression. Uh, so <laughs> I didn't really succeed in being invisible. Um, <clears throat> then we get into composition. I don't think a lot in lines or geometric patterns or anything, uh, but you could say you will have lines in a photo, and here is mainly the line I'm working with, and then that is straight here, and then I'm waiting for somebody walking that's in Tokyo. And then this guy walks by, and he looks at me even. Uh, so that worked well. Uh, you also have patterns. Uh, and I don't think in patterns. This is in Paris. And I'm just following this guy uh, through the park. Uh, and I get uh, this photo. We actually talked with him later. We did more photos on the bench and everything. But that's the one that worked, one of the first ones, even though I was halfway running behind him to get it. Uh, and then you have luck. That's a very important thing <laughs> in life. Um, and here we have, that's uh, a picture I did in uh, Sydney. So we went to the beach. We took uh, the bus out just to see how is it is life on the buses in Sydney and what's happening on the beach. And there wasn't a lot of stuff happening on the beach. And we walked back. And then this girl is there. So I just go down it's with a 21 millimeter. And I take a photo of her. And it's not till I get back that I notice that she's actually standing on her parents' uh, hands there. Uh, and I actually got the email, so they have a big uh, picture hanging in the living room of this one. Um, but it's definitely luck. There was nobody planned this. This is also a lucky photo, you could say. I was in uh, Copenhagen. I had just gotten the like, M240, so that must be four years ago. And we were driving to Copenhagen, and we were supposed to meet a fashion designer, so he's delayed, of course. So we wait outside the gate for 10 minutes. And it's actually the window over there behind her that has, like, it has a look like uh, the 60s or 70s or something. So I'm trying to make something out of it, but I already know it's going to be not that interesting. But I just have this new camera, so I have to do something with it. <laughs> and Different people walk by, and almost by reflex, when somebody walks by, I'll just take pictures because you never know what's going to happen. And this one is actually uh, interesting because you have the graffiti on the wall that looks like a backpack, so it's almost like the same person and all the shade and so on. But that wasn't really what I was trying to do, but that's just what came out of it. This is another one I did in uh, London. So I went to uh, Monmouth Coffee down in Monmouth Street, which is the best coffee. At the end of the day, it was raining. And I'm just sitting on a bench on the street on the other side of the cafe. Um, and just for the fun of it, I'm just kind of like focusing, like putting a frame. But I don't really believe in it because it's, like, I'm tired, and it's like the city is a little bit tired of the rain. And this guy come walking. Uh, and I kind of like that even it's burned out. There's too much contrast, so it's burned out in the street. Uh, I posted it online anyway, and somebody said, hey, that's the singer from the monkeys or something so yeah so he was actually a celebrity also this is in hong kong we were doing a model shoot in the workshop by some stairs with some nice light behind and then a guy walks by and he looks cool and then i didn't grab him and he walks by again so i grab him say can we use your model and we use him for a model for 20 minutes and then he walks off there 
And I said, that's, uh, I forgot his name, but he's a famous uh, television star in Hong Kong. But I didn't know, I just, he looked, just looked cool. And of course, you can do stories also. And here you could say, that's with uh, a wide angle, I think it's a 21 here in uh, New York. Um, and it's not when I take that photo that I feel, wow, this is, I'm making a historic photo or something. But every time I look at it, I really like the whole atmosphere of it with the hats and they're doing photos and you have the skyscrapers behind and the bridge and everything. And it's just like uh, a nice photo. It's not very typical for me, but I mean, 21 is not very typical, so you kind of have to think differently if you use a 21. And how do you do it or how do I do it? Um, this is me. If you notice on the other screen, there's a, one point there's a, a boy on a bicycle uh, coming down the street, and that's actually there. That's in uh, Jakarta. In, uh, and it's on a Sunday, so they have uh, every Sunday the big road is closed off. So everybody's just walking, skating, chit chatting uh, on these uh, main roads that is normally packed with traffic. Um, so what I do there is basically what I do any time I try to get nail something in focus and have a really unsharp foreground and background. And it's just I'll pick a point like that shoe right there and that's set my focus and then I pick my frame and I wait for something or somebody to get into it, walk into, bicycle into it. Uh, and that's exactly what I'm doing there. Uh, so that can be 30 seconds or five minutes, depends how much you believe in what you're going to make. And it's the same also with people walking down the street. I'll pick a frame and say, this is where I'm going to be, and wait for somebody to walk into it. And sometimes nothing happens. And sometimes you get really lucky. Often what inspires it is that you see somebody that looks really cool in that light, and you think, I didn't get it. But if you just stay there, you will be amazed how often the next person that comes is even better. I mean, it's like unbelievable sometimes what you see, you know, a group of nuns or whatever, you know. Uh, so that is again like always wear a camera because you don't really know what you're, go what you're going to stumble into. And the number of times where we get invited into somewhere, take photos of something that, that we didn't expect is like, uh, it's crazy. And we have here is uh, actually the best location we found in Tokyo, <laughs> just one block from uh, way where we started. And again, it's just like that time of day, so this is probably like 12, 1 o'clock a day in the day, and we just walk down the street and like, oh, this alley, that looks really cool. Nothing is happening in there, but the light is amazing. So we walk through that alley, and this is one of the workshop students. Uh, he actually a filmmaker from, uh, or film director from uh, LA, is trying to get this guy. So we did some really cool photos in there, but just because of the light. So it's the light that started. It's not that we actually saw anything, any, anything or anybody special. We just hoped that something is going to happen. Um, and you could say that's part of my style, it's, it's places like this. I would definitely go explore them. Uh, sometimes I don't get them because there's just simply too few people walking through and I kind of need some people or something. <coughs> Here you have, this is from uh, Hollywood last week. And if you have really good eyes, you will notice that it's a Fuji I'm using. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying that one out. And there's another detail in that photo also. And there is a break rule number one in street photography. I bought a suitcase with uh, colors for my daughter. You cannot do street photography if you don't have your hands free. So if you're not allowed to buy anything you cannot put in your pockets or a bag. You have to have your hands free. But this was on the way back. And I'm carrying one of the other guy's uh, camera also. So he's using my, my, he's actually taking with my camera. That's why I have the photo, yeah. And this is the photo I did of him. Uh, yeah. So that's basically uh, a story on this. Uh, there's one thing I will say about uh, lines and composition, because it's a whole subject. And a lot of people have this idea that in photographic composition is about magic lines and rule of thirds and stuff. And what I just went through with the light and the focus, the rhythm and so on, and mainly what is the emotional impact you get from a picture. That is uh, composition. That's the real composition. And I'll say one thing that I know he's not here, but he loves composition. 
uh, and usually does I speak about, and it's really interesting with composition in terms of painting and drawing, because there you can construct uh, a thing before. But one of the reasons why in photography you don't have to take it serious with the uh, rule of thirds and stuff is that the rule of thirds, if you go online you look what is the rule of thirds, you will see the Da Vinci painting of Jesus and the disciples, and there's lines and you can see how he used the rule of thirds. The only problem with this, and what in my opinion shows that you don't have to take it serious, is that uh, the rule of thirds wasn't invented until 200 years ago, and that painting is way before, so he couldn't possibly know about rule of thirds. Uh, and the rule of thirds is basically mainly about that you have a landscape, so you have uh, the horizon either down in the one-third with two-thirds of sky or you have the landscape with two-thirds of the picture and you have one-third of the sky. That's all one-third, the rule of thirds means. So, in generally anything that you think this is a cool photo, that probably is a cool photo, so you should take it and be proud of it. <laughs> and as soon as you start sharing it, then somebody else will tell you that, oh, that's a really cool photo, how did you do that? <laughs> and then you can tell them, well, I I thought, and then you can make up a story or whatever you, you feel like. Yeah. Okay.